November 9th, 1989. That day, the Berlin Wall fell. That day, the barrier that teared Europe apart for almost three decades collapsed. Thousands of people tore it down, trampling the stone that had become their greatest enemy. November 9th, 1989. A new era begins. Another is left behind. East Germany and West Berlin has come tumbling down. How do you measure such an astonishing moment in history? Ils sont debout sur le mur, figés dans l'histoire. September 1st, 1939. Nazi Germany invades Poland, determined to make an entire continent their own. Poland, Denmark, Norway, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, France, Yugoslavia, Greece, all failed to protect their freedom, rapidly falling into the hands of Hitler. Triumph after triumph, Germany never once stumbled. They were unstoppable effortlessly annihilating every enemy standing in the way of their supremacy. To tackle this invincible adversary, Britain, the USA and the USSR formed an alliance. An unexpected entente between former enemies. Russia, 1918. The Bolsheviks had taken over the revolution in Petrograd and had taken command of Russia. But their unpopularity among several groups made them face their biggest obstacle, a civil war. Western countries, fearing the influence of communism, joined the civil war to bring back the Tsar to power. It was mutual. Acting on their shared dislike of Lenin and later Stalin, Western countries refused to give diplomatic recognition to the USSR. Fearing Hitler's impulsiveness as well as Soviet communism, the West tried to appease him by letting Germany take over some territories in Central and Eastern Europe. Stalin understood that he couldn't trust the West. Determined to keep control of his country, he signed the Non-Aggression Pact with Germany, which further increased tension with the West. But as Hitler kept advancing, the West understood that they needed to form an alliance with Stalin. Putting their mutual disagreement aside, they united to combat the threat that they all faced. The reason why both sides struggled so much to form an alliance wasn't only due to their past disputes, but because of the completely opposite ideologies. The issue wasn't really the ideologies, it was the fact that both sides were completely convinced that theirs was the right one, and because it was the right one, they had a duty to expand it all over the world. They both wanted all countries to convert to their system and to have a society that reflected it which made them completely incompatible. A conf because of it, a confrontation between both of them was inevitable. During the Second World War, the members of this alliance, called the Grand Alliance, met three times. In this historic series of conferences, they made decisions that determined the territorial and political structure of post-war Europe. Their three main topics of discussion were the state of the war, the status of Germany, Poland and Eastern Europe and Japan, and the United Nations. The first conference was held in Tehran, Iran, in November 1943. Those present were Stalin representing the USSR, Roosevelt, the USA, and Churchill, Britain. This trio became known as the Big Three. During this meeting, the Big Three discussed many topics regarding the war and the future post-war world. After a series of long debates, the leaders agreed on two points. Firstly, the necessity to create a new international organisation to replace the League of Nations. And secondly, to ensure a weak post-war Germany. Roosevelt and Stalin seemed to work very well together. In fact, Roosevelt even said he got along fine with the Soviet leader. However, 
Churchill did not seem to appreciate Stalin as much, and became very suspicious of him. Roosevelt, who wasn't worried about Stalin's actions, nor the threat of communism, played the role of mediator between the two. However, as the war continued, the post-war aims of the USSR seemed to be very different from those of the West, which created tension. This was clear during the Yalta Conference in February 1945. Once again, the three representatives were Stalin, Roosevelt and Churchill. Again, the topics discussed regarded the war and the post-war world, mainly the concern of the division between Germany and Poland. Each leader had his own agenda. This caused disagreement, especially between Stalin and Churchill. Despite this, they managed to negotiate the creation of the United Nations and the division of Germany into four zones. They then signed an agreement, the Declaration for Liberated Europe, which offered support for democratic governments and free elections in all European countries, including Eastern Europe. Stalin also agreed to join the war against Japan. But this agreement didn't improve their relationship. When they met for the third time at Potsdam in July 1945, the tension was even more noticeable. In addition to their initial disagreement, the circumstances didn't help the situation. Roosevelt died and was replaced by Truman who was less sympathetic towards the Soviets, and much less lenient with Stalin. He was convinced that communism was a threat that needed to be dealt with immediately. Stalin did not appreciate this. Churchill was replaced by newly elected Clement Attlee. Despite being a socialist, he sided with Truman and did not agree with Stalin's agenda. In addition, the USA had tested their very first atomic bomb the day after the conference, leading to a feeling of competitiveness from Stalin and further increasing tension. But the major factor that fueled their struggle was the end of the war. As Hitler, their common enemy, was not a threat to any of them anymore, all their goals and interests were now radically opposed and clashed with each other. Their one and only purpose as allies, gone, there was no reason for working together. Despite the establishment of the United Nations, and the agreement of how Germany was to be managed, it was now clear that the alliance was going to collapse. As agreed at the Tehran Conference, both Britain and the USSR were to withdraw their troops from Iran by 1946. However, Stalin left 30,000 soldiers of his own, claiming they were necessary to dissipate rebellions. His strong ambition meant that he put his own interests before any agreements made which didn't help with the increasing tension with the West. In February 1946, I sent a telegram describing the nature of Soviet foreign policy to the United States of America. In it, I explained how the Soviet Union saw the outside world, a hostile and evil place. In compliance with this, the Soviets wanted to spread Stalinist ideology outside its borders. The USSR's policy was a logical force, which meant that they aimed to increasingly reinforce and strengthen themselves. Therefore, the West needed to react in some way. The information I provided with this telegram had a great influence on the US State Department and led to the US having a progressively more forceful attitude towards the USSR. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind the line lie all the capitals of Central and Eastern Europe. These cities are under the Soviet sphere of influence and are increasingly being controlled by Moscow. The communist parties have been raised to power and are seeking to obtain totalitarian control everywhere. Police governments are prevailing in nearly every case. This is certainly not the liberated Europe we fought to build up. However, I repulse the idea that a new war is inevitable. I don't believe that Soviet Russia desires war. What they desire is an indefinite expansion of their power and doctrines. 
these difficulties and dangers will not be removed by closing our eyes. Western democracies must stand together and strict adherence to the principle of the United Nations Charters to resolve this situation. The Soviet reaction to the Iron Curtain speech was one of outrage. Stalin saw these declarations as racist and a call to war. Following the speech, the Soviet Union decided to withdraw from the International Monetary Fund, intensify anti-Western propaganda and initiate a new five-year plan of self-empowerment. After the Second World War, anti-imperialist, nationalist and pro-communist rebellions started in Greece and Turkey. The USA and Britain suspected that these had been encouraged by the Soviets. Furthermore, communist parties in Western democracies like Italy and France also grew stronger after the war. This increasing popularity was due to the post-war economic deprivations and hardships. Britain and the USA suspected that these new communist parties were receiving encouragement from Moscow. In 1947, the Soviets created the Cominform, a communist information bureau that increased Stalin's control over communist parties in other countries. This organisation promoted the exchange of information between these parties. The West became increasingly troubled by Stalin's actions. The West and the East mistrusted each other and always suspected that the other side had hidden intentions. On the 12th of March 1947, Truman made a speech claiming that the United States had the obligation to support people's freedom against outside pressure. This is known as the Truman Doctrine and marked the beginning of the American policy of containment of communism. George Marshall, US Secretary of State in 1947, declared that the United States needed to assist Western Europe economically to maintain political stability and peace. He created the Marshall Plan, which aimed to both revive European working economies and boost the US economy. Strict criteria was established for applying for US economic aid, such as access by the US to the financial records of the countries requesting aid. Russia immediately refused to join, seeing this as a prime example of US dollar imperialism. The Soviets claimed that the United States had imposed its will on other independent countries by using money to impose political pressure, thus violating the United Nations principles. Stalin also saw this as an attempt to divide Europe in two. The Molotov Plan was devised in response to the Marshall Plan. It resulted in the creation of Comicon in January 1949, which functioned as a centralised agency linking eastern countries to Moscow. It was designed to control their economies, support collectivization, and increase the development of industry. In 1948, Germany was facing a huge financial crisis. Citizens of West Berlin relied on food and energy supplies from the West. In an attempt to economically develop the country, the US introduced a more stable currency in the western sectors of Berlin. In response, Stalin decided to block every road and railway that connected West Berlin and West Germany. The electricity supply was also cut. The West, trying to avoid direct confrontation, decided to send supplies by plane, entering the western sector by air. During 320 days of the Berlin blockade, not once did the threat of a Soviet military response disappear. However, by early 1949, it was clear that Stalin's plan had failed. In May, he finally lifted the blockade. After the Berlin blockade, the political, economic and military division of Europe was prominent. Germany was now separated in two different states, despite the initial aim to have a united Germany after World War II. From then on, the numerous conflicts occurring in different areas of the world reflected the conflict between communism and capitalism. The USA's initial policy of containment of communism in Europe became a worldwide American resistance to communism. This contributed to the USA's participation in both the Korean War and the Vietnam War, considered to be a sort of real-life reflection of the clash between communism and capitalism. 
Furthermore, the UN's role became insignificant, and the USA and the USSR, both being able to use their vetoes against each other, made it impossible to effectively resolve the conflict. Debates regarding who was to blame for the Cold War have not stopped. Over time, three views seem to be the most popular among historians. The orthodox view became the accepted historical position in the United States during the 1950s. The orthodox view, which was to become unsurprisingly the most popular view in America, holds that the Soviet Union was solely responsible for the Cold War. This view is justified using the Soviet Union's expansionist nature as an example. The Soviet Union wished to expand and exert its power over Europe and Asia. The USA also argued that USSR's strong belief in Marxist ideology, seen as the only acceptable political theory that preaches worldwide communist revolution, heavily influenced the emergence of the Cold War. Finally, it blamed the conflict on Stalin's paranoia and fear of the West. Historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr. believed that Stalin was determined to expand communism and that the USA was forced to react to defend democracy and freedom. The orthodox view remained the prevailing explanation for the Cold War until the emergence of revisionist historians in the 1960s who claimed that the United States was in fact responsible for the Cold War. According to those who take this position, the Cold War was fueled by American expansionism and dollar diplomacy. The United States' main motive, strengthening and protecting capitalism through the containment and suppression of communism to assure free trade and secure markets, all for its own benefit. The Marshall Plan itself was seen as a positive act for countries recovering from war, a seemingly free aid to reconstruct their economy. For the revisionists, the Marshall Plan was in reality a way of accessing new markets, expanding American economy and political power, rather than a plan to promote democracy. Their aim was to make sure that as many European countries as possible remained dependent and thankful to the US, therefore ensuring a capitalist society and nations open to free trade with the USA. By being so seemingly generous, the United States secured their position as a leading superpower in the post-war world. Historian William Appleman Williams argues that the USA was not at all an anti-imperialist power and definitely not peace-seeking. Historian and political scientist Dana Fleming states that Truman's obsession with fighting communism was dangerous and one of the primary causes of the Cold War. The post-revisionist view argues that neither the US nor the USSR can be blamed for the Cold War. Post-revisionists stress that both nations overestimated each other's power and threat, which caused a chain of reactions based on paranoia and suspicion. Professor John Lewis Gaddis claims that external causes out of the control of either power were responsible for creating tension. Their opposed needs and wants made the resolution of conflict impossible. Who caused the Cold War? Is there only one power to blame? Is it possible that no country was solely responsible, but rather a series of unexpected events fueled the geopolitical tension? Too many questions left unanswered, maybe for eternity. But no matter who was responsible for the Cold War, no matter who started it or prolonged it, and no matter who ended it, one thing is certain. The Cold War changed the course of history and it will forever be remembered as one of the most unconventional conflicts of the 20th century.